What's up, everybody? We are here today. We're very thrilled because we have Matt Berkey here to talk about a hand that we broke down about a month ago against Chance Cornuth. It was a really interesting hand with some strange decisions involved. We thought it was really cool. We're also going to ask him about some other stuff. He's a rising star in the poker scene. He's been around for a while. Matt, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for being on here. We are, uh, we're definitely interested to uh, pick your brain a little bit. Uh, one of the things we, we admire about you is your, you seem to think differently than uh, we do and a, a lot of other sort of very successful or higher stakes, higher roller type players think, which is uh, always interesting for us. So let's get into this particular hand. I'm just going to go over the whole hand so our audience knows what happened and then you can take us through it, okay? Okay, cool. So it's a 100-200 cash game with a $400 straddle. And Bill Perkins opens in the cutoff with the deuce three of hearts, for some reason, to $2,000. Matt, you're in the small blind, and you decide to call with the ace jack of diamonds. Chance Corneth is, uh, I believe he's in the straddle? He's in the big blind? blind? Okay. Um, He three bets to $10,000 with two kings. And Bill Perkins folds correctly, and Matt calls. So the pot is $22,500. The effective stack is Chance Corneth, by the way, with about 145000 behind. And the flop is 484 with two diamonds. Matt checks. Chance bets $12,000, and Matt raises to $35,000, and Chance calls. Pot now $92,000. The turn is the jack of spades. Matt checks again. That was one of the interesting things we're excited to talk about. Uh, Chance bets 20000 with only about, what, like 60000 behind now. And Matt calls. Now the pot's $132,000. The river's the three of diamonds. Matt makes the nut flush, moves in for about 80000 effective, not 60000 And Chance thinks for a while and finally calls. All right, Matt, take us through your thought process on this. Um, okay, so first I think we should discuss the, uh, the flat of Perkins to begin with. Um, I chose that specific line there because I think my hand is a, a pretty layup three bet candidate. Um, but Perkins likes to play a lot of hands. Uh, I want to encourage him to play a lot of hands, but he also like just gives up to resistance pretty quickly. Um, and given that I have relative position on him, uh, I'm going to have a lot of three bet spots afforded to me versus his opens. And I don't want to like condition him to start playing tighter. So I don't want to like start hammering him with, with the majority of my range from all spots. And if I start three betting the small blind, it can give that illusion, right? That like, I'm just kind of over it and I'm always just going to put in more money anytime Perkins enters the pot. It also becomes problematic because I do have chance to my left and he can see through that relatively easily and start cold fouring. Uh, putting my my three bet range in a more difficult scenario since I'm going to have hands of relative value. Uh, so I like to mix a little bit more, specifically since I'm sacrificing position here. And uh, Joey D was in the straddle. I obviously want to keep him in um, when I have reasonable hands, which I do here. So uh, all those things like kind of culminated in the desire to just flat Perkins, which when he has three high seems pretty good. Um, yeah. I, I guess like going to chances squeeze now, uh, it's something that I anticipate happening often here. I think the sizing is really good uh, given stack depth. Like he should just be sizing up even if he's in his merge portion of range. Um, he's going to have ultimate position anytime I defend. And uh, it's just going to create some like pretty fun SPR spots post where uh, he's going to have me on my heels a lot. Um, that being said, I think he's reasonably wide uh maybe i'm giving him too much credit for being kind of hood there but uh i think he can kind of be squeezing in a little bit of an out of line sense i know in tournaments he he certainly is much more likely to be light here um either way ace jack suited relative or it, it rates to play well post against him so uh i think it's maybe close against a tighter profile but against chance it's a pretty easy call going post then uh, i think yeah. this is where it starts to get a little hairy uh, so we see an 844 flop um, with two diamonds. I flop two overs and a flush draw. Uh, I think the standard here is to just take a check call line. But again, like I think chance is a very volatile profile. And realizing the, the majority of my equity through that line work is going to be really difficult. Um, I'm effectively going to be resigned to having my hand be exactly a bluff catcher. And unimproved, I'm probably going to be overfolding some spots. Um, he's going to have a lot of room to be like over betting turn 
which is just ultimately going to deny my equity or force me to like kind of make a spew shove. Uh, and I don't really like any of those options. I'd much rather take initiative. Um, I have a different mindset in these types of, of scenarios where it's like for most people, it's kind of a sin to be stacking off 300 blinds in a three bet pot with a hand like two overs and a flush draw here. But um, against people who I don't think necessarily narrow their range uh, as quickly as the solvers would would like to see happen, um, I think you can get a little bit more exploitative here and steer into the volatility of it all in order to seize initiative. And also, like, you know, I, I, I know that there probably isn't a lot of credence to it, but denying the equity of, like, king-queen with a backdoor... Uh, I don't know what the offsuit card was. Let's say it's a club. But if he has a hand like king-queen of clubs, which now picks up barrel ability on, say, like the ten of clubs turn, things like that, uh, it's going to become difficult for me to ever call three unimproved. And uh, I could very well be overfolding, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I'm, I know this is probably coming off a little bit of a justification. I'm not saying it's the best way to always play the hand. I'm just saying against Chance, particularly who I have experience with, I prefer it this way. Um, I think in a general sense, a check call line is greatly preferred. Um, and then the last bit of information that I think is rele- relevant is uh, I would check raise pocket eights here. I absolutely have way more fours in my range than chance does, even if uh, the perception is that I don't. Um, and I know that he knows that as well. So like he's leery of it. So I think that like there's a chance he can make mistakes with over pairs, et cetera, uh, once I do choose a check raise. Wow, that's interesting. So you say you have a lot of fours in your range. Like, what, what kind of fours do you have in your range here? Um, so I guess in particular here, uh, I probably don't. Uh, maybe I'm being a little bit, uh, I guess, optimistic. But um, let's say, for instance, Perkins squeezes there instead. I'm probably going to have a lot of my 4X suited that flat the small. Um, even though there aren't a ton of those, uh, I'm certainly going to have like ace four suited that I'm not always three betting there. Uh, I'm sometimes going to have like five four suited. Uh, so I guess I don't have like a pile of combinations, but I would assume that like the squeezer has none. Um, hmm. And sure, you could have ace four suited, obviously, but uh, I, I think it's like a pretty low probability. Yeah, um, it's interesting. So if if you don't practically have fours in your range against chance here, you said mm-hmm. you can have pocket eights. That's a clear, very strong hand. Um, what yeah. other hands do you think you'd be raising here uh, for value for, as a, like made hands that are strong? Jacks plus. So I think that was the other real reason why I like the idea of check raising ace jack is because people mis, uh, misappropriate what my check raise range would be here since most people just don't have a check raise range here. And if you listen to like the breakdown that Ryan Fee did on the hand uh, multiple times throughout, he starts talking about me having pocket fives, pocket sixes, six, seven suited. All of these like hands that kind of touch this board in some capacity that if the solver were to check raise, I guess they would choose these types of candidates. Ace five suited with a backdoor, that, that type of stuff. Um, but in practice, at 300 blinds effective uh, in a multi-way squeeze three bet pot, I don't think that uh, those hands serve us very well. And I certainly... I'm not like going to have a check raise check range um, with very many portions of of the hands that I choose to check raise. So like I feel like if you choose pocket fives, pocket sixes, pocket sevens, um, even seven, six suited, the majority of the time you're going to be forced to like check raise check because you're going to create a scenario where on turn you're at one SPR. And I would much rather choose a range that can just be all in on most turns uh, regardless. So that's largely going to be like jacks plus king queen of diamonds ace jack of diamonds plus in practice you didn't go all in on the turn you actually checked the turn once you hit the jack so tell us about that decision because that was fascinating to us yeah so i think that uh i do have some check raise check it checks in me and uh in in the instance of me turning top pair uh be it with king queen ace jack whatever uh there's just absolutely no need for me to bet any longer um i've effectively turned the nuts in a spot where now I'm like way ahead, way behind. Uh, and even when I'm way behind, like my equity is really, really high. So basically I think what ends up happening is if he does continue through flop widely, when I turn top pair like that, uh, my hand no longer needs any sort of protecting whatsoever. And there's really no equity to press because only better can call. So 
if he has tens, which is a completely reasonable hand to be squeezing versus a Perkins open and a, a small blind flat by me, uh, and also continuing through a call versus a check raise, well, he's not going to make any mistakes when I jam into him, I don't think. Um, that I, It's possible he could call with exactly that hand, but the weaker that the qualifiers become, the less often he's going to be able to call. So when he has ace eight suited himself, or if he's sorry about that, I've done. Right. <laughs> um, so when he has like nines, when he has ace eight suited, uh, if he has like some suited connectors like eight seven or seven six, um, whatever the case may be, he's just probably never calling off with those hands, or at least not at a very high rate. Um, so at this point, I'm going to be shifting from the idea of like trying to capitalize on any hands that I could target to fold to now trying to uh, shift back to uh, equity retention and trying to have him keep a lot more hands in that are effectively drawing dead. So what did you make of it when he bet so small on the turn, 20K into 92K? That was the biggest gift that he gave me in the hand, to be quite frank. Huh. Um, I mean, if he shoves, I'm calling. But uh, when he bets 20K, I'm 100% certain that he has queens plus there's just no doubt in my mind whatsoever uh none of his range is incentivized to make this bet other than value and uh there's no value worse than my hand uh because i have exactly ace jack of diamonds like he can't even have king jack of diamonds i don't really think he's floating with like king jack of backdoor or whatever um and if he is it doesn't matter like i'm just going to lose a little bit of value against that hand sometimes because i'm not going to be all in against it uh, it's just such a small fraction of his range that, like, I'm happy to just call here and unimproved check fold river. That is fascinating. That's uh, that's really cool that you can put him so squarely on Queens Plus there once he bets 20k. That's that's not part of our when we broke it down. We did, definitely did not uh, piece that part together. And that's when we were actually wondering why you weren't if you were going to check why you weren't check jamming. But that makes sense if you're so right. sure where you are. That you don't have to, uh, you can play it perfectly and save the sixty thousand every time you don't improve the river, eighty thousand. Sorry, every time you don't improve the river. Yeah, and I mean it's one of those things where I could just be wrong, but um, <laughs> yeah, you know, we we have it's an assumptive game, so like I have to trust in my logical deductions. And the thing is, is like I'm taking a non-standard line because I feel like I'm able to manipulate the environment pretty well and uh, weave my way through these spots better than my opponents will. Um, and because of that, like when they gravitate back to whatever is default, in spite of the fact that we've gotten here through a non-traditional path, uh, it kind of divulges their hand. Um, and there's really no way for them to protect that. If like you brought chance on and chance said, you know, I'm just trying to extract some value against nines, eight X, uh, et cetera. And that's my reasoning for betting small. I'm not really that concerned about protecting from flush draws. All of that's very reasonable. But uh, you then would have to like challenge, like, well, how are you balancing? And if he says, like, well, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just taking a cheap bluff with 7-6. Uh, and I'm trying to get to a cheap showdown with, like, 10s and 9s, et cetera. It's like, okay, maybe. But that seems, like, rather optimistic. And uh, it seems like a check just serves all of those hands a lot better. Because my range stays wider, I end up with nothing on the river a lot more. Like some of those hands can actually bluff catch. Seven high really has nothing to target that you would expect me to fold for one fifth or one sixth pot. If in the inverse you think when you have kings that I'll also call that bet with tens or nines, right? So like even if the plan is to bet 20k all in on most rivers, there's like very few hands by the end that will go call fold from my range, which now makes sense for Kings, but doesn't make sense with any hands that you would utilize to balance. So um, if then the only hands that go call shove are Queens plus and exactly seven, six, uh, I'm really not making any errors. I don't think by calling the 20 K and then just check folding unimproved. One of the things that makes this hand so interesting is that like trying to piece together how, uh, so the river comes Right, a diamond comes, you get there, and mm -hmm. you move in completely reasonably, of course. And uh, and chance ends up calling. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on our podcast, like batting around, is what in the world can chance put you on to call with? 
right? Right. And it's like, cause you call the turn. You don't, you don't move in yourself when you have a very easy move in when you have a lot of flush draws there, you know, like mm -hmm. it seems impossible to think you're going to check call with just a draw on the turn. Um, so you, you, you kind of have to have at least one pair and then what, what pair could that be? Unless it's sort of a weird air, air play on the flop where you have like Jack 10 suited or something like that. You turn a Jack and then play it this way, but then move in right. on the river as a bluff. It mm -hmm. just seems like very hard to come up with anything that makes sense, personally, anyway, as I think about it. So do you have any thoughts on that? I know, you, I know you're in your head, not in chances, but still. Do you have, a, you have thoughts on that piece of it? Well, I've, I, yeah, I mean, I think I, I talked to Chance about the hand after we played. So like I have some idea of like his thought process there. Uh, that's why I can say kind of he was targeting 10s, 9s, and 8s, or 10s, 9s, and 7s with the 20K bet because that's what he told me. So I believe him, and it makes logical sense. Um, I think it's... It's kind of what happens when uh, we we position ourselves down one specific line or path without realizing that there are many forks in the road along the way. So by betting the twenty thousand on the turn, targeting a specific portion of my range, um, a lot of assumptions are taking place there. Anytime I continue with uh, just a call, and now what happens is the assumptions actually don't even take place. They've kind of been largely ignored because that scenario uh, hasn't really been examined beyond he has to check call with 10s, 9s, 8x. Um, and because of that, now whenever I shove a diamond, uh, especially when he has the king of diamonds and can eliminate me having king queen, king jack, right. uh, ace king, right? Um, he's reducing my stronger combinations of diamonds that could have went call, call, pre. Uh, he just is kind of forced into leveling himself into making, and maybe it's not even leveling himself, right? It's just like, I have one of the few combinations that play this way. Ace 10 of diamonds is probably just open shoving turn. Um, same with ace queen of diamonds. So it's like, I pretty much just have to have Jack X of diamonds exactly. And I probably only have three combinations of those, uh, queen Jack, Jack 10, ace Jack, uh, and not all of them necessarily check raise flop. So uh, given the price he's being laid, it's kind of just a scenario where it's like, I have to have it here, but what if I just don't? The thing, <laughs> the thing that I think uh, is kind of being lost and dismissed is that I have pocket jacks and I have pocket eights. And both of those serve really, really, really well in a check raise check uh, type of line where uh, I just plan to check raise check call lead all in. Um, and the reason why it serves very well is because it's just a line you don't see. So by the time you get to the point of it going check, raise, check, call, it, it's just always present that Jack or uh, Chance has a hand. And now when the diamond hits the river, uh, he may say to himself, like, he has almost no flushes here. And that may be true. However, uh, I might have some full houses or four X's that also take this line. And now we're just shoving that diamond because by now Chance should have something. Mm -hmm. Um now, I might not shove with the 4X because Chance should have some flushes. But with all the full houses, it's like, now if he doesn't have an overpair, he should have achieved a flush by now. Uh, there's very little that's going to fold to my shove. Thinking more about the hand, uh, you talked about both just now, you can have pocket jacks. And you had said earlier when we asked you, uh, if you when you're check raising, what value you have there? And you said you have pocket eights and jacks plus. Uh, practically, how many big pairs do you have in terms of jacks plus there when Perkins opens and you're in the small blind and you flat? Probably all of them hmm. uh, for the reasons that I listed. I just don't think that I was um, – I, I, I didn't want to lose – no offense. Like I, I like Perkins. He's a nice guy, but it's like I don't want to lose him. And I definitely don't want to lose Joey D out of the big. It's just like he's going to flick in that call so frequently. Uh, and I also don't want to take away squeeze spots from, from chance. So even if I have aces, like I'm pretty certain I'm flatting there. Um, it's just more of a question of do I back raise when I right. have like queens plus. And uh, given depth, I probably would just flat queens. I would just flat jacks. And because of that, um, I may only be back four betting kings. Huh. Uh, exactly. Because uh, aces, need, aces need no protecting, and they help to protect the rest of my range. Um, kings kind of need a little bit of protection against like Chance's bluff range, which will be either very mergy or if he's if he's constructing very pulled he's just gonna have a lot of ace x in his range um so i'm gonna want to get in as much money as i can 
right, that makes sense. So in practice, do you actually ever show up with sevens or nines on the river here with this line? No. No, never? Zero percent. But, like, I don't want to make that common knowledge. No, that's fair. No, we'll, we'll keep this just between the three of us for sure. Uh, sure. Do, do you show up with any bluffs here on this line with in this spot? I don't think. I, I don't think I really can. Um, I mean, yeah, I think the assumption is that I would be able to turn a pair into a bluff here. But I think chances range is just so transparent to me that, like, I'm willing to check fold the top with ace jack. Hmm. I can't imagine that I'm suddenly, if, if I had a different holding and I had, like, 10-9 of diamonds – that I would play it this way and then shove river. Oh, I guess that's not a bluff. Uh, ten nine of oh, right. spades, yeah. right? Ten nine of spades, right? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. There you go. Do you, yeah. Do you think that um, your I mean I don't even know if this is fair to say, but your reputation, for lack of a better word, your image, maybe sort of in the high roller poker world, where um, you might be seen as a little bit more uh, reckless. I don't know if that's the right word, but like a little more no, it like. Is. Okay, great. I'm glad you think so. Um, <laughs> So maybe then it's he just sort of feels like, well, I just have to hold on with certain hands, even though yeah. nothing makes sense. Mm-hmm. That sort yeah, of plays and, into the whole call. Yeah, and I mean to be fair, like I, I only think chance. I think chance's only mistake is the turn. Uh, I think he should just be all in and understand. Like, like I don't think against tricky opponents you should play tricky. There's no need to respond in a tricky manner. Uh, you're targeting too small of an assumptive range. Um, you know, a lot of times I'm just going to have what you think I have. And if I have total dust, you're not going to induce a check shove. Like I'm not, I'm, I may be reckless and I may be a little off the beaten path, but I'm not stupid. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not going to have seven, six of clubs and see him bet one sixth pot on the turn and just be like, Oh, this is my chance. Like if that were going to be the line I was going to take, I would just be all in myself. Right. We're like 1.1 SPR. Right. I, I had the option to open shove and I didn't. So that should tell you that I'm either trapping or I have a hand that like can't continue. Um, but yeah, I, I think my reputation precedes me in a lot of ways. And I think that that's, uh, that's a lot of deserved hard work <laughs> I've put in. You know, um, I, I think people discredit a lot of how important the environmental aspect of the game is. You know, it's, uh, it's a scenario where like, we like to believe that we can all play like machines and that we can all emulate the solvers and, and things like that. But at the end of the day, like we're emotionally driven creatures who just react and respond to whatever the environment's giving us. And I try to monkey wrench that as best I can. Do you think you end up getting just a lot more calls on rivers in these kinds of spots than other players like Christian might get Christian Soto, of course, uh, mm-hmm. co-founder of Solve for Why, um, because of your reputation? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think like just, I get different responses than the field as a whole. So I don't know that chance ever isn't all in against the field on the turn. And I don't know that chance doesn't make an exploitative fold against the field on the river. Uh, I've seen him. He's plenty capable of, of making a hero fold. Um, but yeah, it's just like, all we have is our assumptive process and deductive reasoning at the end of the day. So how precise you are in those two metrics are going to be what allow you to kind of like navigate your way through the tree. And the idea that like all you have to do is study the spots and study the charts and, uh, you know, break it down to the point of like, well, this is how I apply against everybody. It's like, OK, that works um, when the environment is pretty consistent, which is what you'll see online. There isn't a big fall off from the 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 best six max player to the the guy who's grinding for rake back of course there's a gap but it's not the same gap as between an elite live player and the guy beating the game for three big blinds an hour uh that gap is it's a canyon right um and because there's such a large gap there there's also the introduction of like all the different different personalities and images and uh applications you know volume is non-existent in the live realm all you really have is your ability to play longer play better uh and apply at at a higher rate than the field so um you know it's easy to get swept up if you're a volatile profile who plays a lot of hands and does some things a little bit funky well it's really difficult to just like run your mind through the rolodex and say like what would the solver do in this spot it's like i don't know i haven't even begun to analyze what the check raise check range looks like obviously people react differently to you on the table than they react to a lot of other players 
So are guys and, and women that you're playing with at these stakes, are they often picking your brain off the table because you play differently than most of the competition there? No, no. I think that uh, as far as we've come in the evolution of poker, the game is still insanely ego-driven. And um, there have been very, very few spurts in my career where I think my peers have thought of me as being like trendsetter or good or elite or anything that qualifies in a positive capacity. I would say just very generally speaking, <laughs> the the community or the environment as a whole um, just thinks that I'm I'm crazy or weird or off kilter and that, you know, my results are inflated and I'm probably dead broke and just lying to everybody. That sounds like kind of a fun guy to be, to be honest. That sounds like a pretty good spot. It's profitable. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's extremely profitable. Um, yeah, so speaking of, of players that you play against normally, that's not going to necessarily happen at the World Series of Poker. We assume you're going this year to play some events. Is that correct? Yep, full schedule. Okay, cool. So you're, you're going to be playing against much different competition than you're used to in these high roller events. You're going to have to play against more of the layman, I guess, is a way to put it. Do you prepare sure. differently? Do you adjust your strategies for those situ situations? Um, it's kind of the opposite. I prepared differently, I think, for the uh, elite competition. So I'm, I'm doing a lot more study of, of where I'm weak when I'm playing a super high roller or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, but more importantly, I'm spending a lot of time like analyzing their strategy because I think the field as a whole is studying in the same way. Um, you know, it's, it, I was talking to Christian about this the other day and I, I've been trying to like model this out for, uh, for some time now and I'm, I'm working towards it, but basically if we qualify um, like people in four four quarters, right? Two hemispheres, four quarters. And in the upper hemisphere, we have like linear, uh, heavily logically based thinkers that are of higher intelligence. And then in the upper right corner, we have abstract, philosophical, um, kind of like out of the box thinkers that are highly intelligent. And then beneath them, we have kind of linear, lesser intelligent, um, emotionally charged people. Uh, and beneath the, the right hemisphere, we have fully emotionally volatile human beings uh, who, who can't really lead with their intellect. Well, those are four extremely different qualifiers, right? And you need to teach to each of them very, very differently. But the training material that's out there and the voice of the community and the way the game is being kind of propelled forward is only teaching to that upper left echelon. And that is probably the vast minority of certainly the world, but very likely even this community as a whole. So it's no surprise that you see Bonomo and Ike and Schindler and all these other guys who fall into intelligent linear thinkers as the elite. But uh, you know, as environments continually change and as we progress more in the live realm and things like that, well, there's three quarters of the population that, you know, isn't robotic and can't just immediately turn off their emotions. And, uh, one quarter of that, or I guess one third of that is of super high intelligence too. So it, when we get more voices, I think from like the abstract philosophical camp, uh, and we start like training more towards why rather than how and what, uh, you're going to speak to those emotionally charged people as well. And it's going to allow them to start to formulate strategies that uh, kind of embrace who they are, what their strengths are and everything else. And you may see a massive, massive shift. Uh, I, I really do truly think that this is what we're working towards. And i um, good friends with Nick Howard and he spent – half a decade delving into the solver work and he has mass data analysis and he built his game around it and he just hit a dead brick wall and eventually realized that like this game is rooted in people and as long as the human element exists exploitative play is going to be heavily rewarded to the person who can calibrate it best so it's like that shift might just occur and you may see a big replacement of of who the elite is who the voices are and how training metrics exist Phil Helmuth back on top. Uh, <laughs> no, you hung around that, this long for a reason. Yeah, I mean, that's really fascinating. Um, as someone, you know, 
doing poker study, you know, we're we're constantly talking poker and thinking about it, and so much of it is taking this more logical linear approach, like you're talking about, and thinking it through that way, mm-hmm. as opposed to these other quadrants. So that's that's really fascinating to think about and try and uh, potentially study for that as well. Um, coming coming on to the study thing a little bit more. So you've been doing this for a while. How much do you study these days? Like poker, just practically, how much are you studying on a week-to-week basis? Um, it's different. Uh, it's hard to qualify it as study because it's kind of more just like work. But a lot. I mean, I'm spending 40, 50 hours a week uh, constantly trying to improve the product that's solved for why, constantly trying to expand it, move laterally off of it, all these things. So, like, you know, just this, like, model of learning that I'm talking about that I've been trying to flesh out uh, here in the office or whatever. It's like, to me, that's a form of study. It's something that eventually I'm going to teach, but in order for me to be a, a, a good qualified coach, I have to be able to, uh, not just understand the study metrics themselves, but also understand all the individuals that I'm teaching to. So I can't just teach in one vein and whatever sticks, those are the students that progress and everybody else falls by the wayside. I need to figure out a way to teach to the kinesthetic learner, the audible learner, the visual learner. Like I have to hit all these metrics. So, um, you know, I'm studying a lot more abstractly, I guess, than I have in the past where it's like I may have started down this path in like specific spots of like, oh, man, when I play with Garrett, he just gives me hell on my left. How can I figure out the best way to neutralize that Uh, to where now I'm kind of getting more into like, okay, well, let me extrapolate Garrett out to a profile type. And let me lump that in one category and then let me lump Ike in another category. And, you know, eventually I have like five to ten profiles that I could sit and, you know, list out their characteristics and figure out like where they're weak, where they're strong, how that intertwines with me. And, you know, it's basically just like this big dance that we're exchanging uh, non-verbally at the table with money being the way we keep score. And to me, that's like you know, on a, on a human level, that goes way, way, way deeper than just studying the analytics of the game tree. And you, of course, are teaching these types of things to your students. Uh, so we asked your co-founder, Christian Soto, uh, the same question here. Do other pros get kind of mad at you that you're spending all of your time trying to teach people to be better at poker? Does that kind of hurt their feelings a little bit, like you're ruining the game type of thing? Um, I don't think, because again, I don't think like the majority of the community agrees with me or with our side of the things. Um, but I've, I've, I've had one person complain about it. He's a good friend, uh, Nick Mamoni, um, and he's a fellow spew. So like maybe he, he's afraid that like the secrets are going to get let out. But, uh, yeah, just generally speaking, I think like, I think, I think poker training as a whole probably gets, uh, a bad rap number one and number two probably just lacks a absolute ton of quality control. Um, I think it's like really sad and unfair. I I understand the idea of free market and like, you know, the, the weaker will be weeded out and stuff like that. But like there are some products and I don't, I don't care to like throw anyone under the bus, but there are a handful of products that I know are doing incredibly well, making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in the training community. And it's sad. It's just like, it's really unfair. It's the equivalent of a, 300 pound guy eating McDonald's showing up to your doorstep when you're desperate to lose weight because you have diabetes saying like, I'm your personal trainer. Are you ready to get to work? And, and, you know, it's like, that's, that's a mean way of putting it, but it's, it's very true. It's like, there needs to be a way where we can, as a, as a community police, all of this and kind of say like, is this guy really qualified or is he just really good at sales and marketing? It's like, I got a phone call from one of my competitors he just had people cold calling trying to sell his product and it's like this is so scammy like this is so you're selling snake oil and everybody who's anybody knows it but like you're selling it to the broadest tier of people and you know that liquidity may be the same as 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 the middle and the top combined and you know the middle and the top combined may be the ones like looking you in the face going you're you're scumbag but like the bottom is what we really have to protect because it's not a top down economy. You know, if 1020 ceases to exist live at the Bellagio, 
then all of those regs are forced to now drop down to 510. And when that happens, they start to eat up the regs there who are now forced to drop down to 25, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until eventually like the bottom of the ecosystem is wiped out. And now 510 and 25 will cease to exist because nobody can progress through. The best players are just stuck at their limits and they're just taking all the money because that's the nature of no limit, right? Big mistakes are just punished. And the way that we alleviate that is we rise the better players through the ranks and leave the leave the, the learning pool alone effectively. You know, it's like there's a lot of people who are elite that could just jump into one, two or 50 cent a dollar online and just like print and make a good living doing it. But like at what cost? It may be at the cost of no limit existing. That's a really interesting perspective. I mean, obviously, poker is ripe for scamming, but haven't really thought about the training element of that. And that's a really, I, of course, you've been doing this for a while. So you understand the training element and what goes into it and how much work you actually have to do to, to create a good product. So you have a unique and good perspective on it. That's a, it is kind of sad when you put it like that, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where it's like I hold us to an incredibly high standard. And, uh, you know, I see all the negative feedback and, and the, the pushback from the community. It's like I embrace it. It's it's fine. If you want to quality control us, like, let's go. I'm happy to divulge everything. You know, I want to lay it out there. But I am very certain that if if given a panel of their peers that we all hold in high regard and consider to be elite, if we allow them to judge each and every one of the metrics out there, there would only be a select few like upswing run at once. Those guys survive. They're the best. They're putting out great products, right? I'm confident in our product. But there's another big portion that is sucking from the bottom that should just be like scorned from the community forever. Wow. Hey, um, we know a lot about what you guys do at SoftwareWide, but I don't know if our audience does. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it and describe it for them? Sure. So uh, it initially began as a an immersive uh, experience where – we brought three people in – or sorry, we brought nine people in for a three-day training experience. Um, it gets it gets paralleled to like WPT boot camp, uh, you know, things like that. It's, it's, it's similar in nature. It's very, very, very different in content and delivery. Um, basically, our goal is uh, we're interested in problem solving and we want to do it from a different stance. Uh, most problems up until this point have been solved from a – an identification of what is the problem and then how can I solve it most simply uh, and most immediately. And that's great. That, ser- that, that served us very well for thousands of years as we evolved. But we're high-level creatures now and we're playing a very intricate game. Uh, so answering why first uh, I think actually lends itself to more optimal solutions. So if we can even identify why the problem exists at all on a macro level – it allows us to kind of solve the problem backwards from a micro standpoint. So we don't, we don't talk about like, what do I do with jacks under the gun? It's much more about like, what do I do with range under the gun? And then am I still having a problem with jacks? Right? Because like what happens is a lot of those micro problems will just be alleviated as you start to solve from a macro standpoint. Um, So, you know, we're not really teaching anything specific in the sense of like, well, you should 3X or you should do this with these types of hands, et cetera, et cetera. It's more like you should have a strategy. And I get it. The, the, the barrier of entry to creating that simple concept is really, really high. So let us show you why you need one and how to get that process started. And I don't care if you're loose. I don't care if you're tight. I don't care if you want to emulate what we do or if you want to create something all your own. You want to be totally down the GTO path? Let's let's do it. Let's figure out the best way to create that bedrock for you to build off of and then continue down the independent learning path. That's like our really our major concern is having people question enough things intrinsically that they don't need us down the line as a crutch. They can just kind of like utilize us as a guide instead where it's like Hey, I've been thinking about this concept where I'd like to, you know, start increasing my frequencies in these types of environments. What do you think? And now we can give them feedback. That's so much better than a student coming to you and saying like, hey, I have this hand history and I don't know if I fucked up. It's like, who cares? 
It's it's isolated. It doesn't mean anything. It's not indicative of – it may be indicative of a larger problem, but you're not going to solve it by getting feedback on this hand. Yeah, that's a really interesting approach. Um, so you had mentioned that you have a subscription service coming up for that. Is, is that something new coming up? Yeah. Um, so the other big thing that kind of like led us down this path is just that we feel like, you know, poker hasn't gotten its fair shake and it's an incredibly interesting environment. It's, it's, it's a non-traditional field. Um, and I'm very confident that society as a whole is interested in it. Um, and we just happen to have the best production crew around. Like they're the same guys who produce dead money. They're close friends of ours and, uh, they've been working with us since day one. So, uh, what we decided to do is kind of split into two paths, half half training and half entertainment um, that kind of like sheds a light behind the the poker sphere, if you will. Um, so kind of in the same vein as Dead Money, we have a few, pro- few projects like that. One's called Solve for White Origins, and it kind of displays Jordan, Christian, and my paths to getting to the company and arriving at this point of wanting to to train the, the, the community. Uh, we have another one called To Be Determined, where, um, you know, basically I was in a grind house in AC for WPT with Christian and a bunch of his buddies. And one of his friends, Oscar was just like, you know, he's been playing one, two for the last couple of years, barely getting by, like literally, you know, has $500 to start every month and just tries to grind out a thousand bucks to pay his bills, et cetera. And this kid used to play like as high as 10, five, 10, 10, 20, you know, it's, it's been a big fall from grace and I'm watching him grind like micro stakes on ACR and like, just the emotions with every single hand. And like, I was just like, you know, dead money was great. It, it gave insight to my backstory and the high roller circuit and like what goes on to prep for that. But this kid, he represents the community. Like this is who people are going to relate to and understand. And at some point, every one of us had been exactly Oscar. So I was like, you know, let's shadow him. Let's, Let's do everything we can to like tell his story and, you know, we'll try to insert ourselves and help him as best we can and understand that that help may come in the sense of him walking away from the game. Like it almost doesn't matter how it ends. It's just important to, to kind of like show that, you know, this game is fucking hard and it takes a lot of luck and things falling in place and diligence and hard work to even arrive at an opportunity. And then you have to cash in on that opportunity. It's like, you know, we wanted to put that stuff on display. So that's going to be a big half of like the the entertainment process from the the training material. Um, we have four coach or sorry, five coaches. It's me, Jordan, Christian, the Just Hands crew, and Matt Hunt. And we're all going to release videos monthly. Uh, on top of that, we have a couple premium podcasts and. Uh, our like flagship show that I'm super pumped about. Uh, it's called poker out loud. Um, it's going to be, I don't know how much I'm supposed to talk about it cause we're supposed to be protecting our product now that it's not out yet, but, uh, it's basically like, uh, the five coaches I just listed and Nick Howard playing a six handed game of five ten, where, uh, every time we have a decision, we're wearing noise canceling headphones. We just discuss it out loud. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, I've already seen the first two episodes. It's, it's awesome. It's like I don't like consuming poker content. I've watched each of them three times and not because I'm in it, but like I'm that enthralled by the whole idea of like the aesthetics of the gameplay look great and then the 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 well spoken manner of everybody at the table it just like keeps you really engaged and it's hard hitting and you know, it's like I think it's gonna pivot a lot of uh the way people train. That is such a good idea. And I'm jealous Thanks. and I wish we had thought of it first and I wanna do it now, but we won't because it's yours. Uh Matt Berge, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was incredibly interesting and informative. Really great to sort of get a, a window into your your thinking and your thought process and sort of how you do it. Because it really is a different a different thought process for sure than where we're coming from. And it's really illuminating. So thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it.